Hey Internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And if you're still watching the show week in, week out, even though we aren't doing all the cool, flashy editing that you've come to expect from Worldview Everlasting, well, we really appreciate that. I'm trying to keep these things, these dropkicks coming out to you, kind of old school style Greek Tuesday and Ask the Pastor, uh, because, well, I, I hope you want it. So, you know, if this is something that you like, good. I'm glad we are continuing to work on our goal for this fall, which is something uh, new, improved, and more often kind of the best of all worlds. Uh, Peter is back from Africa and hard at work researching the technology which is needed for that, which if you want to support that endeavor, uh, you can continue to support the show. Uh, links below, of course, you have a place for, for regular giving if you want to do that. And if you're uber, uber curious, you can message me or Peter and we'll kind of fill you in on what the details are. But for today, I want to get right to Hebrews chapter 11 and then just a smidgen of chapter 12, which is the upcoming epistle reading in the lectionary. Uh, I think it's series C that we're still in the three-year lectionary. Last week, we were in Hebrews 11, the first part, this catalog of the saint and sinners, the faithful yet struggling individuals of the Old Testament who all the while through their temptations, struggles, and sin clung to the promises of a better land that God had given uh, initially to Eve and then to each of them in turn that something was going to come to fix what they saw. And so they never really settled, as it were, in the present age, just as we as Christians should not feel that this is our ultimate home, but they kept looking forward to that homeland, that better coming that the Christ, the Messiah, the seed born of woman would bring. We cut off halfway through the description of Abraham's life and uh, mainly he was focused at that point on this image of the land, right? This promised world that would be perfect, which of course we look forward to when Jesus returns. Uh, but then he shifts in the text that's going to pick up this week to talk about how in his faith he also submitted to the ultimate sacrifice, was, which was after God had finally given him the fulfillment of the promise, at least in part, promises like multiple sons, as many as the stars, he at least gets one son. God then asks him to sacrifice that son to him. And the beautiful thing about this is it explains how he isn't doing this thinking the son's going to actually die. What it is, is it's testing his faith in the resurrection from the dead. And so he considers, since this son is the guarantee of the promises, that the entire salvation of the world will rest on this one boy's flesh and blood, there is no way that he could actually die. Like, even if he actually dies, God's going to raise him from the dead. And so, of course, he is willing to go and do this. I'm sure that the devil was on his shoulder harping the whole time and causing him to doubt, causing him to question, perhaps I'm mad, all this kind of stuff. But he goes to do it anyway, and then God, of course, spares him the event, saying, no, 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 if anyone's going to sacrifice their son for the life of the world, eh, it's going to be it's going to be me, right? And that's, of course, what God does by offering up his son, our Lord Jesus, on the cross as the propitiation for all of our sins. So the, the catalog of the faithful, what, what is it all based upon? It's all based upon God speaks... And it is true. doesn't matter what we think. doesn't matter how we feel. When God speaks, it proves to be true. And though we array ourselves against that word, there's nothing that we can do to stop it. And the saints of old, all they did was they heard that word and they said, Amen. So be it. This is the way that it is. So after Abraham, we move on to Moses, right? Who lives in Pharaoh's household, who has the entire issue of being in the, in the desert and speaking to the burning bush and all this. But he tells us that Moses also considered reproach, right? Being hated for Christ's sake of more value than everything he could have had in the land of Egypt. Being a, a son in the house of Pharaoh, he'll give all of that up according to the promises which the true God has spoken to him. And this great line here that by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkled blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch him, right? So so God's sending plague after plague after plague. He's like, oh, by the way, put a little blood from this lamb on your door so the next plague doesn't hit you. And of course we would say, how can, you know, the blood of a lamb do such a great thing right it's it's just it's just a physical thing it can't have a spiritual effect right like bread or wine they can't be spiritual water can't be spiritual but moses doesn't try to argue with god on the basis of his reason instead he just accepts god at his word and what happens the destroyer spares the firstborns and yet does kill the firstborn son of pharaoh and all the egyptians right also a prototype, a, a foretaste of the sacrifice of a son, right? Notice that theme here, a son by which the people are redeemed in his death. So by, by faith, they crossed the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish. All of this based faith on what, right? Faith in what God has said. And Rahab's a great example here, especially 
It's not like she has a personal promise coming to her, but she knows from hearsay that the word of God, the Ark of the Covenant, is in the midst of this people. And she's like, that's the true God. So I don't want to be outside of that camp when they come into this land that was promised to them of old. I want to be inside of that camp. So, of course, when the spies come, she hosts them and gets connected to them, right? And what more can he say? He can't talk about all the saints of the Old Testament. There isn't time for that in this little sermon. But he goes into this catalog of the, the pain and suffering, the trial and travail that the Old Testament saints were willing to do. I mean, it's pretty amazing. It's one of the scariest things in, in, the, in the Bible, in my opinion. You know, people who were tortured, refusing to accept relief, suffering, mocked, flogged, stoned, and then sawn in two, which I believe is a reference to Isaiah the prophet that tradition holds, was, was cut in half. But that's how he died. You know, right through the gut. I mean, just, ah, right? And here we are, poor little Christians in the modern world. People say we're stupid and mean. And so what do we do? We get shot and we hide in the corner and we pout because we wouldn't want to offend anybody, right? And there's much to condemn us here in this passage uh, as cowards, as people who in the face of uh, real persecution may indeed just be that uh, the, the, the plants with no root that burn away. Now, can we build our own roots? Of course not. All this does then is create repentance. And that's the goal here is for you to be like, yep, I'm a coward. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a coward. I am not worthy of these saints. The world's not worthy of them, as the author says, and so neither am I. Have mercy on me. Which is really what the whole point of this is in the end. I mean, he's been, as the author of the Hebrews has been throughout the book, kind of He's rough. He's fire and brimstone style. Well, most of the Bible is. Preachers who don't preach fire and brimstone aren't preaching the Bible. But he's he's fire and brimstone style, and the goal is to bring you to repentance so that he might also lather upon you the goodness of the gospel and who Jesus is, right? So stoned, imprisoned, killed by the sword, sawed in half, going about, destitute and afflicted. The world is not worthy of them. All of these, though commended through their faith, that is, trusting in God's word, which was counted to them as righteousness, did not receive the promise of full righteousness revealed in Christ. Right? They never saw Jesus. They didn't understand the full sacrifice that he gave on the cross. I mean, it is not, it is not prophesied that he will be cruciform in any specific way, nor in an obvious way that the death and resurrection must take place. you got the sign of Jonah, of course, but it's, it's, it's veiled, it's in shadow. And so they're still waiting for this, and yet they trust what they have. Like, well, I don't understand it, but God has said it. So even the prophets, Peter says, I think it's in his second letter, could be his first, even the prophets are like, they prophesy, and they're like, well, what does that mean? How is, how is this going to take place? You and I, we live on the other side. We got to see it take place. We don't need more revelations. We don't need more prophecies. We got the fullness of time, right? Uh, God has provided something better for us, he says, and that together then, basically, in Jesus' death and resurrection, we are made perfect, and on the day of resurrection, we shall experience that perfection. So, since all of this has happened in the fullness of who Jesus is and what he has done, since we are surrounded by witnesses who believed in far more difficult prophecies and words of promise, covenants, institutions than we have, let us also then lay aside every weight and the sin that so closely entangles us, right? Let us put aside our cowardice. Let us confess of his sin. Let us put aside our doubts in what promises God has instituted as covenants of the New Testament. Let us put aside our need for the belly to be filled and for our, our passions to be tickled and run with endurance, that is, faith in God's word, the race that is set before us, regardless of what may come, right? Setting one foot in front of the other, doing your vocation day by day, hearing the word of God for Pete's sake every single Sunday because you need it. It is the font of life. And then, as you are able learning, training, becoming capable of confessing it yourself, speaking it out of your mouth that the world might hear this great confession all the while, not trusting in your ability to speak it, but looking to Jesus, the founder, and I like the old NIV, not usually, but here, the author, right? The writer, the one who does it, and the perfecter, the completion of our faith, that all of it rests not in our ability to achieve it or even to believe it. So let us look to the one who does it for us because he is where we have confidence, security, and certainty, all because for the joy set before him, knowing what he was achieving, he endured the cross for you, right? Scorning the shame, scorning the fact that he was humiliated simply by becoming a man, and then more than this, submitted himself to even death on a cross, whereas we learned from Paul in the book of Colossians last month, your debt has been entirely paid he is sufficient. And now, seated at the right hand of God, it's not like anything's going on that he doesn't see. It's not like he doesn't know what's taking place in this world. Why do we not believe that he said, I've washed you. I've claimed you by, me, by name. Take and eat. You are mine. Here are my words. Trust me. 
kingdom of God. Yeah, good stuff, right? The ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're creeping on 10 minutes. That's one heck of a drop kick. Hope you have enjoyed listening to the, uh, the author of the Hebrews writing in chapter 11, getting you ready for this coming Sunday. And we'll see you again later this week with an Ask the Pastor question from you. And if you want to ask those questions, go to the Worldview, Ever, uh, the Worldview Everlasting.com website. You can ask a question there on the sidebar. Uh, try to do as many as we can. All right, catch you next time. Rock on.